continue with the medical theme uh, and support groups. My name is Mark, and I have a brain. It's nice to meet you. So what I do for my day job is I facilitate uh, solutions for complex design problems. I help corporations figure out how to get things done. But what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is how I discovered that I have a brain. So a couple years ago, about four years ago, I was diagnosed with OCD uh, as well as uh, depression and general anxiety disorder. So I had OCD, I had a range of quite severe symptoms. I had to stand in front of my stove to make sure it wouldn't turn on and burn the house down. Uh, it manifests itself in all sorts of other symptoms as well. Compulsive sexual behaviors, uh, like I said, depression, compulsive hand washing, compulsive pretty much anything you can think of, checking the door, etc. I had to do it. And it consumed my life. And I essentially got swallowed up by my brain. I was crushed by my brain. Who I knew I was and who I believed I was was completely different from who I acted like on a daily basis. So I figured I actually had to get help. So I finally went and got help. Uh, and I did something called exposure and response prevention therapy. And that's where you basically expose yourself to what makes you anxious, and then you don't react to the anxiety. You don't respond in a way to cope with, check on, or control anxiety. Now, what's interesting about those three is that that includes a lot of sort of what we think of as normal things we do every day. And so that made me realize, okay, well, if I have to cut out all these normal things, and these normal things are what are making me sick, then something very strange is going on with my brain. But through going through this process, through a six-month process of ERP, I actually got a lot better, uh, completely better. Uh, it transformed my life. My brain works totally different now than it did before, and so I sort of became friends with my brain. And that was the moment when I realized, okay, I have a brain. And I'd never thought about that before, and I hadn't considered what implications that meant. So I started to look into brains. Uh, and what I quickly realized, and you can see up here, this is a picture of your brain cut in half, is that there's all this other junk inside of your brain. I always think of the brain, or I thought of the brain as just as a wrinkly thing, but inside at the base there's all this weird stuff. And when you start, when you have an anxiety disorder and you start to look into that, you hear a lot about your amygdala. And your amygdala are two little bumps of sort of brain tissue uh, at the base of your brain in the limbic system. And the limbic system looks like a Romulan warbird. And the amygdala are where the warp in the cells are. Okay? And, and they change in size. We know that if you have a larger right amygdala than left, that you're more likely to be conservative. But we also know that lesbians have larger right amygdala than heterosexual females. We know in general that larger amygdala are associated with having autism and depression and more Facebook friends. So we know that if you have a large right amygdala, you're likely a, cabinet, a lesbian cabinet minister in Stephen Harper's cabinet, and you have a lot of Facebook friends who help you through depression, but you're also autistic. Okay? And so actually, we don't know what size means and why it matters when it comes to the brain, but we do know that size changes and density changes very quickly. One of the areas where we've seen this happening is meditation. We know that 30 minutes of meditation every day for eight weeks will shrink the size of your amygdala and make your hippocampus, the memory center of your brain, larger. We don't know what that means, but we know that it happens. And what's interesting about that is that it shows just how quickly your brain changes. Because when you think about it, you probably do something for 30 minutes every day, and you've probably been doing it for a lot longer than eight weeks. And so you start to think about, well, what effect does that have on your brain? Because I was engaging in compulsive behaviors, hours of compulsive behaviors every day for many years, and that made my mental health worse and worse and worse. And so what I realized is that it's a lot like cardiovascular health. And so you think about this, if you don't take care of your cardiovascular health, it gets worse. And so normal, everyday things, like even just walking upstairs, becomes incredibly difficult and strenuous. And mental health is the same. If you don't take care of your mental health, like I did, eventually very normal things, like leaving the house, become this epic, incredibly anxiety-inducing effort. Okay? And so because of that, this statistic shouldn't seem that strange, that nearly half of all people will be diagnosed with a mental illness at some point. Okay? Because how many people actually take care of their mental health? Right? A lot of people know that they need to take care of their physical health, but not a lot of people are taking care of their mental health. Although I'd say at the same time, that statistic isn't that strange because we know that 100% of people have mental health. Right? So just like you have physical health, if you're not taking care of your mental health, it's going to get worse. Unfortunately, we have this illness-first approach to mental health right now. We wait until you get ill before we start to talk about mental health. Now, we don't do that with cardiovascular health. We don't wait until you have a heart attack before we start to talk about your physical health and your heart health. And that made me realize that, okay, zombies actually care a lot more about my brain than I do. So I decided, I'm going to start to worry more about my brain and think about my brain a lot more and use my brain to sort of help my brain get better. Uh, and really, then I was sort of wondering, okay, so, so what? What am I going to do? So right away I was like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about mental health. Now, the weird thing is, as soon as I started doing that, people were like, oh, 
what, what about the stigma? Are you worried about stigma? People are going to stigmatize you. And that was really strange, I found at first, because, and often it would come from mental health organizations. It was kind of odd, because being afraid of stigma, so that's being afraid of the possibility of something bad happening. Well, that was part of my mental illness. That's all OCD is. You're constantly worried about bad things potentially happening. So I describe stigma as a fluffy squirrel holding a fake monster mask. Right? Everyone's scared about it. Everyone talks about it. If you run at it, it just sort of goes away. Okay? One of the areas where I found uh, really great to start talking about mental health uh, c- happens with internet addiction. Because most people you'll find do, if we go back to that 30 minutes a day, do something kind of compulsively online for 30 minutes a day. So very early on, and that was a problem I had. Uh, and so very early on, I wrote a little book on internet addiction. I found if you talked about internet addiction anywhere, say at work, people would be like, oh yeah, no, that's really strange, yeah. Oh, my boyfriend's always on Grindr when we're out on dates, and my girlfriend's addicted to Facebook. But then inevitably, they would stop by my cubicle later and be like, oh yeah, that internet addiction thing? Like, not that it's me, but h- how would I know? I'm addicted, and I very quickly realized that everybody has mental health, right? So that was the moment where I was like, okay, this isn't just me. I'm not weird. Actually, everybody has a brain, and everyone's dealing with some sort of mental health issue because we all have mental health and varying levels of mental health. So I say when it comes to mental health, when it comes to making it better, start by talking about it. Start by letting things out of your brain because you really have this cognitive digestive system up here, and you need to let things out. You need to let your brain poo because if you don't choose when your brain poos, it's going to poo for you, and it's going to poo over everyone around you, and it's going to mess up your life, and it's going to stink up your work life. So you really need to think about letting that out. One area where you can do that, you can join us now. We've started a mental health community that's just about how to take a proactive approach to mental health. It's called Everybody Has a Brain. Uh, we have a Pinterest account too. Uh, there's Twitter, the work, so please join it. It's a bunch of designers, and we all share proactive tips uh, and discussion about mental health. So thank you. Thank you.